from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of my favorite authors, Stephen L. Carter. I am a devout Stephen Carter fan for many, many years, and one of my favorite books that he's written uh, in the years past is The Emperor of Ocean Park, which is set in Martha's Vineyard, <laughs> where my family and I have spent some 20 plus summers. Uh, Stephen, as you know, is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law at Yale University, where he has taught for almost 30 years. His law degree is from Yale as well, and he was privileged to clerk for the Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Stephen is the author of seven acclaimed works of nonfiction and three best-selling novels. His latest novel is Back Channel, a suspenseful reimagining of the events that became the Cuban Missile Crisis. Please join me in welcoming Stephen L. Carter back to the National Book Festival. Well, thank you very much, it, uh, uh, Joanne, for that lovely introduction, uh, and thank you all for coming out. It's lovely to be back at the National Book Festival. It's lovely to be back in my hometown of Washington, D.C. Last night it was wonderful to be at the stadium. I was there to watch uh, the Nationals come from behind uh, victory. There are only five games back now. The Mets lost, so there's hope. There's, there's hope. It really is a, a great joy, and I've over the years done a lot, of, spent a lot of time talking about books, writing books obviously, but, and when you write a book you go on these tours, but the part, the only part of the touring I ever enjoy is actually talking to people who read the books. And as Joanne told you, I write both fiction and nonfiction, uh, and a lot of my nonfiction books are what my sister-in-law calls the everybody is entitled to my opinion uh, kind of book. And the reason I mention that is wh when you write the kind of nonfiction that I do, uh, you go on book tour and you go and uh, speak to an audience. A lot of the people there are angry. And, and they're not necessarily angry at me. Uh, they're angry about the subject of the book. They probably haven't heard of me and haven't read the book, but they heard someone is going to be talking about. So for example, I published a nonfiction book a few years ago about um, the United States and war. One of the soldiers I teach at Yale, where, by the way, Joanne, that was very kind of you, but I've actually taught for 34 years. This is my 35th year teaching at Yale. Uh, <laughs> but one of the, uh, uh, one of the subjects I teach is the ethics of war, so I wrote a book about that. Uh, and you won't be surprised to learn that when I ever went to talk about it, there were a lot of angry people. They weren't angry at me, but they wanted to vent. They wanted to vent about things, and so they would come and that ask questions, what were supposed to be questions, that were these speeches that go on for 10 and 12 minutes. Well, that's why it's not fun to go on nonfiction tours, but, but fiction is nice because the chances are if people come, uh, they've read the book or want to read the book, or at least they're smiling as though that's the, <laughs> the case. They're not usually, uh, not usually angry, although with one of my earlier books, I did once have someone who came to me with book signing. In fact, I think it was a politics and prose in, in here in the city. Uh, who, who said, how dare you write a book about me without my permission, uh, <laughs> one, of my, one of my novels. Um, now, <laughs> I've fallen a little behind in my writing. As some of you may know, I was, I was ill. Uh, I'm doing fine now, uh, by the grace of God. Uh, so I'm back, to my, uh, I'm back to my writing again. Uh, and one of the things I'm trying to work out, I'm, I'm wor at work on several different novels. I'm trying to I mean, get some of that in the Q&A period if you're interested. And, uh, and, and one of the things I need to decide is which of those several novels I'm going to uh, turn into my next published novel. And I'm, I'd be interested in your input about uh, that. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about writing, at least my writing process. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Back Channel, uh, the last, uh, the most recently published novel, the one that, uh, that Joanne mentioned. And then I'll be delighted to take questions or, or comments uh, uh, from you. Um, I am, as you know, a law professor. That's a full-time job. I, I work very hard at it. You'd have to ask my students, uh, one of my former students I discovered is here today, you'd have to ask my students if I'm any good at it, but I like doing it. It's a lot of fun. It's a full-time job. Writing fiction 
is a part-time job. Um, years ago, my publisher wanted to turn me into one of those people who could turn in a novel every year. And they told me, they said, you'll sell a lot more books, you'll make a lot of money. But the only way I could do that would be to give up being a law professor. And I never wanted to, um, uh, to do that. I enjoy teaching, I enjoy legal scholarship. And I find that when I write fiction, it exercises a different part of my mind. I'm not sure what the difference is. I'm obviously not no sort of neuroscientist. Uh, but it's a different part of my mind that's being exercised. Um, I was at a writer's conference once, uh, and an aspiring young writer asked the panel, uh, where do your ideas come from? We were all novelists. And one of the panelists um, said, uh, you should never ask that question uh, to a writer. I don't know if any of you ever follow uh, the Twitter hashtag, 10 things not to ask a writer, which is actually very funny. Uh, Although some writers are very bitter, it turns out, toward the, but the, so you might not enjoy reading it, I don't know. Uh, but it, he said, you should never ask that question because the only honest answer is, I have no idea. Uh, and I think it's a, that's partly true. It's hard for me as a part-time novelist to figure out where the ideas for my novels come from, except that they all tend to begin with characters I want to write about uh, instead of with a story that I want to tell. I come up with a character and try to embed the character in a story. That's what I try to do. Um, but it's hard for me. Uh, that is, it's not that writing nonfiction is easy. It's not. But writing fiction is even harder. It, it does something to me. I don't know exactly what. But it's emotionally exhausting, I find, to, uh, to write fiction. Uh, I can spend hours and hours and hours on a single page or even a single line. There's literally, there's a line in the second chapter of my novel, New England White, on which I spent two weeks on one sentence. That's literally uh, true. I was very proud of the sentence when I finished. Uh, <laughs> but I, I have to make a better investment of time than that. I have to f that, that wasn't very, a very sensible thing uh, 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 to do. Um, it exercises a different part of my mind, and in that sense gives me a break from the work of a law professor in writing nonfiction and doing my scholarship, I do some op-eds and things like that. Different parts of my mind, I can't say that I enjoy one more than the other, they're just very different. Um, I am, I mentioned that I've been a little ill and my energy isn't what it once was, and because of that, the trade-offs are harder to make. That is to say, it's not as though I can ever, I can spend five hours a day on one and five hours a day on the other or something uh, uh, like that. I have to make choices about which to do, uh, uh, to do when, that's taken some getting, uh, some getting uh, used to. But I do enjoy writing fiction, and one of the reasons I think I really enjoy it is I like getting to know the characters. I am one of those writers, I will confess, uh, who has the problem that Kurt Vonnegut used to talk about, uh, that I'm often surprised by my characters. They, they take control of the story in certain ways. They won't do the things that I had instructed them to do when I was writing the outline. Years ago, on Martha's Vineyard, as a matter of fact, I went to a talk by a very successful uh, novelist, one of these people who turns them out and they do very well. And I was in the, sitting all the way in the back, uh, and at the end of her talk, I was one of the people lined up to ask her a question, and I asked her something like this. I said, do you ever find out, do you ever, when you're writing, that you have to throw away your outline because uh, you lose control? The characters end up doing things they're not supposed to do. And she said, no. And I realized that there's a reason that certain people are able to turn things out at a faster rate because they have a kind of discipline uh, that I suppose that I lack, perhaps because I just am too fascinated by my characters and therefore let them get away with things the way that you might spoil a child. And my characters end up being like that uh, uh, sometimes. Um, you may not know this, uh, but in addition to the novels I publish under my own name. I've also published a, a few novels under a pseudonym, uh, which I'll tell you, which is uh, A.L. Shields. Uh, and in the A.L. Shields novels, I also had that problem, but even more so, of my characters refusing to do uh, what it is that, uh, that they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and therefore, I haven't published one of them uh, in, uh, uh, in, in a while. Um, having said that, though, I should explain further about my process that 
Although the characters become unruly when I'm writing, I know that's going to happen later. When I'm first writing, what I, where I begin is I have characters that say there's stories I want to tell. With minor exceptions, they are almost always people from an earlier novel or related to people from an earlier novel. And so I asked myself, what would be an interesting story to tell? And I can almost never think of one at first. So what I do is I ask myself, if I had a novel about these characters, how would I like it to end? And this, I have no story, I have no beginning. How, where do I like to be at the end? And I tend to sit down, this is how I've written almost all my novels, I tend to sit down and write the ending. I write how I want things to come out. That's without having a story yet. Then once I know how things are going to come out, I ask myself, where could they start off that I could make an interesting story about how they got to the ending? And then I sit down and I write the beginning. So in all but one of my novels, the way the novel begins is pretty much the way that I sat down and wrote it when I didn't have a story with minor changes. The one no novel in which that was not true was uh, Palace Council, where I wrote an entirely new uh, uh, beginning. In every one of my novels but one, the ending is pretty much the way that I, uh, uh, I originally envisioned it or put it down, uh, or, or put it down uh, on paper. The only one, interestingly, in which that was not true uh, was the novel I'm going to talk about in a moment, which is Back Channel, the novel that uh, I published last year. That was the only time I changed uh, the ending. Then, when I have a beginning and an ending, I then, I still don't have a story, I write some scenes. I try to write some scenes with the characters to get to know them better. Maybe half a scene, maybe a page and a half. Sometimes the scene is just something is like a, the creative writing exercise you might have if you take a writing course. You know, you might have this homework that says, uh, write 250 words in which someone goes into a room and something happens and she changes her mind. Have you, have you ever had to exercise like that? And some of the scenes are just like that, nothing more than that. Others may be more tensing to chase scenes, someone being attacked, someone finding a secret, someone finding a dead body, something like that. And I have three or four of these scenes, I then say to myself, okay, now I can write an outline that gets me from the beginning to the end and uses all of these scenes. Now you might think this is hopelessly complicated and it's a case of the tail wagging the dog and you'd probably be right. But nevertheless, that's my process. That's how I uh, do it. Now, having said all that, Back Channel came about a little bit differently. Back Channel, as Joanne told you, is a novel about the Cuban Missile Crisis or more to the point, it's a novel about how the Cuban Missile Crisis could not have been resolved successfully without the help of a 19-year-old uh, black woman uh, who is a college student. And this novel, unlike the others, came to me uh, as uh, high concept in a way, based on two things that actually were true. The first thing that, that was true was that uh, part of the solution to the Cuban Missile Crisis we don't know how much, the historians still debate this, but part of that solution came about as a result of a so-called back channel, which was to say, in addition to the official negotiations, there was an unofficial negotiation that ran from the president through his brother, President Kennedy, through his brother Bobby, uh, to a Soviet intelligence officer named Alexander Fomin. His real name was Alexander Fexilov. Uh, and that story is true. And they met at various places around Washington, including uh, most famously, a restaurant up in uh, Cleveland Park, now uh, closed a, a few years ago. So that's one. That was one fact. The other fact is that when Robert Dalek uh, wrote his biography of JFK uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, he disclosed uh, President Kennedy's affair while he was in the White House with a 19-year-old college student. And later, you, you may not remember, the networks made a big deal of this, and they found the college student, and she said it was true, and so on. So, but for me, the high concept is, suppose that there wasn't an affair. Suppose that instead, the 19-year-old college student was the conduit to Alexander Fomin, the Soviet intelligence officer, and the affair was a cover. You add that to the 19-year-old college student being black, and I had a new story, and that was where the idea, I still had to come up with characters and write a story, but that was where the idea uh, uh, came from, and I kind of uh, 
uh, ran with it after that. I had a lot of fun with that. It was the second novel I've written in which I tried to write about a particular historical period, and that meant doing the work to bring that period to life. Those of you who read my novel from 2012, The Impeachment of Abraham Lincoln, uh, might remember that there, in particular, I put an enormous amount of care into creating the city of Washington as it would have been at the time of the events, the imagined events in that story, which was 1867. I worked so hard on getting in, in that novel and getting not only the sounds right of the city, even the smells right of the city, even uh, I, I wanted to get the city right to the extent that if I describe a scene that was where two people were sitting on a porch, I wanted what they could see from that porch to be what they really would have seen from a porch at that location in 1867. That was very hard work, but it's also the kind of work I was accustomed to because in addition to being a legal scholar, my formal academic training is in history, uh, and so that was actually a lot of fun, although the work was hard. And so in doing Back Channel, also set mostly in Washington, D.C., um, footnote, it also takes place in, among other places, Ithaca, New York, and Bulgaria. Uh, but what I tried to do once again was to bring to life the city of Washington as it would have been in 1962, that is half a century before the events of the novel. Now, I lived in Washington in 1962, but I'm not going to pretend that I was old enough to really remember in detail everything about it. I remember some little things about it, but most of what's there is uh, research. Now, when I, was, when I sat down and decided to write a book that involved the Cuban Missile Crisis and involved this young black woman who I think I rather cleverly found a device to put her in the midst of the uh, story, because you're probably sitting there saying, why in the world would a 19-year-old kid be at the center of the story? Well, you have to read the novel to find out why she was, but, <laughs> and maybe you'll be persuaded, I hope so. But when I sat down to do that, I discovered something else that I'd forgotten. I'm also a chess fan. I'm a chess player, but not a particularly great one, but I'm a big fan, especially the game and its history. And uh, in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the uh, Chess Olympiad was taking place in Varna, Bulgaria. And heading the U.S. chess team, the Olympiad, each uh, country has a team of players and they play each other for a month and so on. Uh, heading the U.S. team was a 19-year-old genius named Bobby Fischer. And suddenly, that gave me a structure for the story. That is to say, I could run part of the story through the Chess Olympiad and there, bring Bobby Fischer in as a character, who's someone I actually I'd always wanted to include in a novel, and I finally had the chance to, uh, 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 to do it. Uh, and then I had a story, added in some bits and pieces of characters from my other novels, uh, and the story kind of wrote itself after, uh, after that. And I want to emphasize, in that sense, writing back channel, while it wasn't easy, was much more straightforward than writing my other novels. I, I wrote it much more, I think, as a traditional novelist uh, would, as opposed to by the, through the structure that I mentioned uh, uh, before. Now, having said that, I, I'm going to say one other thing about my novels, and then I think I'll stop and take questions uh, that, you, uh, uh, that you might have. Um, when, I, uh, when people talk about my fiction, there are different things that they call it. I've heard my novels uh, called thrillers, and I always appreciate that as a compliment. I've heard them called mysteries, which I also appreciate as a compliment. I've heard them called multi-generational family sagas, which I really appreciate as a compliment. But I don't think they're any of those things. They're just entertainments. I, I'm not writing to make a point. Uh, reviewers are always accusing me, whether in a friendly or unfriendly way, of making a point. They always talk about there's this social commentary, they always say, and things like that in my novels. I'm not sure exactly what that means. I'm not writing to make an argument. I'm not writing to tell people the way things are or should be. I'm writing because it's fun to write. It exercises a different part of my brain. And I'm writing because apparently my novels entertain people. That is to say, when people stop reading them, I'll stop writing them because no one will publish <laughs> them. But as long as people will read the stories that I write about these characters whom I really love, then I will keep on writing them until the day that I die. So I think I'll stop there and take questions and comments that, uh, that you might uh, have, if any. 
I, I understand there's microphones. I can only sort of see them because of the, uh, uh, of the light. So if you have a question, please come up to the, uh, the microphone, and I'll just go back and forth. Yes? Hello. Um, uh, again, Professor Carter. Um, I told you one of my former students was here, and right. here she is. Um, I can testify to the whole audience that he's much more enjoyable as a writer than a law professor. Um, <laughs> I don't know quite how to take that, but all right. Well, um, he's, uh, I've always thought he was uh, most akin to the terrifying professor in the, uh, the paper chase, if you ever saw that oh, movie. I hope not, but, but all, all right, go ahead. All right, I, um, perhaps you never thought about this, uh, perhaps you have, but I was wondering if in some way, conscious or not, the characters and the lives that you um, take on and develop in your books have any relationship to your perspective on jurisprudence either in some sense that indirectly they would benefit from changes that you think ought to happen based on your work or you see them as people whose lives in a positive way squarely fit within um, existing uh, structures uh, in the that, law? That, that's a really good and a really hard question. I'm going to answer part of it. I may not be able to answer uh, all of it. I give you three small and, and different answers uh, uh, to that. First, only once in my novels have I actually tried to imagine legal argument, to set it out as actual legal argument, and that was an impeachment of Abraham Lincoln, the second half of which is this hypothetical imagined impeachment trial. And there I worked very hard to put legal arguments, including constitutional arguments, in the mouths of the lawyers and other participants in the proceedings. But I don't know that I did so in any sense trying to model my own uh, views. But it's funny you ask that, because when that novel came out uh, in, uh, in, in 2012, um, I got a number of questions on tour about what current controversies I thought the novel might be applicable to, and I didn't know how to, to answer that. I said it was interesting that people wanted to do that. Having said that, let me go back and I said I'll give you three small answers. Uh, of course, my work is necessarily informed by, uh, what, by what I do and by what else uh, I know. I wouldn't say that I try actively to associate my fiction with my jurisprudence, but I'm sure there must be an association. I'm sure if somebody sat down to write a a paper, I don't know anybody would, but if someone did and they were trying to look at some of my articles and books of nonfiction and look at my fiction, they could find these parallels, I, I, I suspect. Um, which leads me, uh, in a way, to the, uh, my third point, which isn't quite what you asked, but which I want to answer uh, anyway. I, I, I said that the novels are um, entertainments, and they're works of the imagination. And the reason I emphasize that is Remember I told you the story a few minutes ago about, uh, or I mentioned a few minutes ago, the woman who came to me on book tour and said, why did you write a novel about me? Um, I, I sometimes get questions that go something like this. Uh, I, I have written two novels that are told heavily from the point of view of a woman rather than a man, and people say, well, how can you do that? You're a man. Other people would be very outraged um, uh, about that. I, and I appreciate and understand, I think, the outrage, but I think that when that question arises, uh, I, as a novelist, look at the world slightly differently. Everything in the novel is invented. Uh, the, the question, not your question, but the qu when that question arose, it, it presupposes that if I write a novel from the point of view of a man, it must be me. It must be my own views. And I hope that's not true. And so, for example, uh, the novel uh, that Joanne was, was kind enough to say the, those kind of things about, The Emperor of Ocean Park, was told from the point of view of a black man who was a law professor in an Ivy League school. So people said, ah, oh, it must be autobiographical. Uh, why else would he have written that? And I cringed to hear that because I didn't myself find the narrator of the Emperor Park particularly admirable, which would say there were things about him that I liked, but there were a lot of things about him I didn't like. And when, and, and it was very hard to persuade people it was an invented uh, personality, as they're all inventions, and whether it's a man or a woman or black or white, they're all inventions. But I think that the burden of your question is no doubt right, and there have to be connections between my 
jurisprudence, my writing of other kinds, and fiction, even though I myself don't know exactly what, uh, what they are. Yes. Yeah, uh, just a question. I almost, uh, I'm almost nervous to ask this uh, uh, based on what you said earlier. But um, I was wondering, do you, have you ever gotten in a situation where you're writing a novel and you, uh, you run into a situation where your plot just kind of like grinds to a halt and you don't know how to like take it forward? And if so, I mean, what do you do to break the log jam? I mean, uh, and part of what informs my question is, um, you know, when, I, when I've been doing my writing, uh, I, I've never belonged to a book club. It's always just me alone in my room, which may be part of the problem. But, um, but anyway, I'm wondering if you could maybe give some insight on, the, on how do you, uh, well, how do you well, break Well, yes, to the question, do I ever run into situations where the plot just seems to break up and not make sense anymore is when we think about it. And uh, according to my critics, all the time, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I run into that. Um, but sure, everybody has writing blocks. Um, I ha the one advantage I have when I've read is black is I can do something else. That is, I can say, you know what? The thinking cap isn't working for the novel right now, and so I'm going to go work on my nonfiction book or, or in this uh, article for a law review or, get, or do some more research for my teaching uh, day after tomorrow or something uh, like that. So I can always find some other intellectual activity uh, that, will, uh, take th th that will take hold. Um, but every writer suffers that, and, and I've talked to some of my friends who are writers about it, and, and some of the better writers I know tell me that when they have a writer's block, they just write through it. Um, they, it's the old Graham Greene idea. You know, Graham Greene's theory was you should write this for the same number of hours every day, uh, whether it's a blank page after that number of hours or whether you've got 20 pages. You should say, I will sit at my typewriter, he says, for that period of time. Uh, and I understand that, and most writers I know who are serious are like that. They will fight their way through this, and it is a fight. It is, you know, writing a novel is, that is hard. You're wrestling all the time with so many different strands and trying to get these unruly people to do as they're told, only to find out it's kind of like you have a little Goldberg problem. You know, that you fix this thing over here, and something's popping loose uh, over, uh, uh, over there. But really, I don't think there's any other solution but that. There's either you can work on something else that also stimulates your mind, or you can write through it. Now, I know people who say, that's when I like to take a walk, that's when I go swimming, that's when I do this or that. And those strategies may help also. Uh, but for me, the best thing has always been, if the novel's not working, I can go work on something else. Now, the downside of that is it means it takes me longer to write, because I won't sit there and just write through it, and I'll go work on something else. And then, by the time I get back to the novel, I will want to do, I want to do what Francis Ford Coppola called the cardinal sin of writing. I want to go back and look at page one again to make sure that it's right. You know, Francis Ford Coppola was famous, so was I suppose, around Hollywood for the writing these screenplays really, really fast. He could write a draft of a 90-page screenplay in two weeks. And people said, how do you write them so fast? And he said, because I never change it. That is to say, when I'm on page two, I never go back and look at page one. He said, you write the whole thing, no matter how bad it is, then go back and try to make your changes. He says, once you stop and say, wait a minute, maybe I didn't have that right on page one, you'll never get to page two. And I have that problem a little bit. I am an inveterate tinkerer. I will go back and look and go back and look and say, what if I did it that way instead of this way? And that's really bad for writing. It's not the same as a writer's block, but it has the same effect. Mm -hmm. Yes? So I want to play a little bit with an idea. You say you write to entertain others, but is it really entertainment or is it work when you're writing a book? Or is it, like most work, like being a law professor, something you love to do so you doesn't seem like work, even though other people watching you would insist it's a lot of work? Well, that's a complicated question. I, 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 let me just answer very briefly the, the second part and then the first. Uh, I think that most novelists would say that when they are writing, they hate it. They love being a novelist. The people who love, I've heard this so many conferences over the years, the people who say they love being a novelist, they really mean they like writing the end. That's the part they love. <laughs> uh, the, or seeing the book come out. But the rest of it, it it's drudgery. It's awful. There is no reason to do it, except that sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes you, you have no choice. Anna DeVere Smith once said that the only people who should become actors are people who when they are acting, there is something that happens to them, something that comes out of them that never comes out on any other occasion. Therefore, that thing would otherwise always be inside them. So they're the only people who should act. That's who should write, because it is absolute drudgery. It's horrible. 
it is a lot of work. When I say I write to entertain, I don't write to entertain myself at all. I work really hard and often in ways that are quite exhausting, my wife would say injurious to my health, uh, because I like to entertain. Because, I, because people, then when they come out, people come and they smile. And, that, and I like that part. I, so I do a lot of work to get those uh, smiles. You need only to keep smiling or I won't be able to do the work uh, uh, anymore. Yes. So I learned today from your comments, I did not know that you wrote under a pseudonym. Can you talk about why you have done that and what the difference is between writing as Stephen L. Carter and writing as A. L. Shields? Why did I write under a pseudonym? Uh, because I, I don't know the complete answer. The best thing I can tell you is that I wrote, I went to my agent and then we started talking about what would happen if in addition to my other works I decided to write what we labeled, and this is, wasn't meant as a criticism, but a more conventional thriller was the way that we put it. Um, by which I think she meant something short that people would be able to read and not have to go through these long convoluted paragraphs and plot twists and so on. I think, I think that's what she meant. She was trying to be nice. Uh, and so, but on the other hand, uh, it would, by doing that, it would strip away a lot of, remember I told you people I was talking about the social commentary? So we're going to strip all that out. You know, the, the I can't take, keep, they say never mention other writers when you're giving a talk because people go buy their books instead of yours. Uh, but, but I love I, Elmore Leonard's line uh, that I leave out the part readers skip, he said. That's the secret, he said, leave the part readers skip. And I really wish I could do that. I, I wish I had the discipline to le re leave out the part readers skip. My editors try to cut out the part they think readers will skip, but I usually fight and keep some of it uh, in. So I tried to write these novels that would leave out the part readers, uh, uh, readers skip. They were not my most successful novels. They didn't sell all that well, but writing them was kind of fun. Uh, and again, maybe that was yet a third part of my brain I was exercising. I don't, uh, I don't know. I, I suspect I'll probably write more of them under that pseudonym or under possibly uh, uh, another one. Thank you, and I'm glad you mentioned Graham Greene. He's one of my favorite writers. Oh, good. Hi, good afternoon. I've read a number of your books, uh, but well, I think I that, that my favorite is the one on civility. And because we are about to go into an election cycle, and which is, we're going to need a lot of civility in that, would you mind giving the audience just a brief overview of what that book is about? Well, uh, I'm, I, first of all, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I'm often asked uh, what my favorite of all my books uh, is. And like most authors, my favorite is the one I just wrote. But Civility is the one book I wrote that when I go back and look at it, I think it came out the way that I wanted it to. That is to say, most books, I'm like most writers, you talk to almost any writer, and they will tell you how much they hate going back and looking at their own published work. They, I can't believe I wrote that paragraph, that sentence is ridiculous, I don't know why I didn't fix that hole in the plot, things like that, it's awful. But when I go back and look at Civility and I read it, I think, and I wrote that book, that was almost 20 years ago that book was published, uh, I, I think I, I agree with what I said, let me put it uh, that way, which might sound obvious, but I don't, that is not usually the case with my nonfiction books, I find a lot of things usually to disagree with. Uh, instead of giving an overview of the book, which might take a while, I, let me tell a little story, a piece of which I tell in the book, uh, which will help illustrate what I mean, especially, say, with an election uh, uh, coming up. Because one of the things that really bothers me uh, about politics in the United States, and this is true across the spectrum, is how dismissive we've become of people who disagree with us, that they're either idiots or they're evil. It can't possibly be that issues are hard and divisive because they're hard issues in which people of re reasonable people of goodwill can disagree. But I think that is why most issues are are hard. So let me tell you a story. Joanne was kind enough to mention that I was a law clerk for uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall, who's one of my great uh, mentors and favorite all-time people. Um, what you may not know is that in addition to being his law clerk, during the last year of his life, I was also the interviewer for his oral history. Uh, we didn't finish. He died before we could finish. But we recorded probably, I think, 32 or 34 hours of tapes. They're in the Federal Judicial Center, if you ever want to read the transcripts. I don't think the originals have been released, the tapes, but the transcripts are there. Uh, and one thing that was really striking as I worked in the oral history, one of the things that he really enjoyed doing was talking about people he'd known over history, great people he'd known and, and, and so on. And uh, we talked about a lot of the well-known segregationists of the day, um, politicians and others, many of whom he actually knew uh, for various reasons because he used to spend a lot of time with some of the segregationist governors and senators 
uh, as he used to put it in back, in back rooms, he would say he spent time with them uh, playing cards and drinking whiskey, was the way that he, uh, he put it. And he used to say, he said, I don't care what a man has to say to get elected. I care, can you do business with him? By which he meant, was his word good? When he sat down and made a deal, would he stick to it? And he would tell these stories, and then the oral history about these various backroom deals that he made. Everyone knows the cases that he tried and, 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 and so on. Uh, and if you've read any biography of him, you know about the times he had to flee lynch mobs, uh, sometimes in one particular case led by the local sheriff. But the untold stories, this other part of him, the part of him who would sit in these back rooms to avoid litigation, to avoid a demonstration, uh, to avoid various other problems, and make these deals with people who were, had these horrible views. But when he spoke of them toward the end of his life, when I was doing the interviews, he spoke often with respect and sometimes with affection. Uh, he would laugh and tell stories, and he would clearly, at this point looking back, be glad for the time he'd spent with them. And he could look across that divide over what I think most of us would agree was the greatest moral horror in the United States in the 20th century, as it had been in the 19th and the 18th and in the colonies in the 17th, the divide of race. He could look across that divide as people on the other side of that question and still say there are human beings who happen to be wrong. Let's sit down in the back room and do some business. And the notion that the things that we argue about today are so much more important than that, that we cannot sit down with those people and can only be dismissive or derisive on either side, I find that terrifying. I find that absolutely terrifying. Marshall, I think, was right. It's not to say that we can't criticize people. This is a democracy and we should speak loud and forcefully on behalf of the things we think are right. We should never shy to do that. But once we lose the ability to respect those who disagree with us, we're not a democracy anymore. So that's the, how's that for a summary of the book? Thank you. Thank you. I think we only have time for a couple more questions. They're gonna shove us out of the room in a minute. So let's be, keep these last few very, very short. Thank you, Professor Carter. One of the things you said at the end of your organized uh, formal remarks uh, was hugely interesting to me, which is that something to the effect of uh, you will stop writing when we stop reading, when the readership stops, stops reading, a, a keen awareness of the relationship to the audience. And perhaps you've partly answered this question in just what you just spoke about in terms of civility, but no law professor has ever said, I will stop writing when they stop reading. Um, <laughs> It, 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 it strikes me that you have a voice in two very different spheres, one of which I would say is perhaps a bit of a push and one of which is a pull, the way, the way you describe how you may be pulled by, by your readers to do that work. It strikes me it's also the two most important spheres, if you will, law, jurisprudence, and storytelling. But they have very different ways of acting on the body politic, on the audience. What are your thoughts on the relevance of academia as somebody who is probably more read as a novelist? Thank you. Um, I'll try to be very brief because I don't know we only have two or three minutes left. Uh, I, one of the things that, that scares me about the academy, about college universities generally, is they're becoming less relevant, which is to say, don't get me wrong, I don't think that everything that happens that professors do has to be practical. I think there's an enormous space for abstract theoretical work, for people digging up old civilizations that most people will never know or care about or finding subatomic particles that won't have any effect on our lives for coming up with abstruse philosophical theories because they make sense, not because they're gonna change the world. There's room for all that and that's terrifically important. Nevertheless, in the end of the, in the, end of the day, uh, the traditional function of so-called liberal education is to prepare young people for life, for responsible life as adults in a democracy. And I worry that in that sphere, we're becoming less relevant and not more. But I also worry that literature is becoming less relevant. The tastes, reading tastes of the public are changing a lot. People like things that are shorter and less complex. I'm happy to, I enjoy things that are short and less complex also, but I think there's a room also for more complex um, uh, reading. Uh, 
it, it's quite striking to me that someone like, say, John Updike, his last few novels didn't even make the New York Times uh, bestseller list. Uh, he wrote novels of enormous depth and complexity, and I think that's really unfortunate. I, I'm, I'm troubled that someone like Toni Morrison is selling fewer novels than she used to when, when one comes out, because again, she writes with this beauty and depth and complexity, and the reason that matters is that reading complex literature, readings that are hard to get through, uh, and make us think stretches the mind, and stretching the mind is also really important, I think, to adulthood and to uh, citizenship. One reason I'm so glad to see all of you here today uh, is precisely because people who come to a book fair tend to be the kind of people who are not afraid of complexity, who want to talk about literature, read literature, think about literature, and so as long as book fairs get big crowds, I think we're in good shape. When you all stop coming, Put aside whether you read my, if no one ever reads another one of my books, when, when people stop going to book fairs, they don't want to hear from authors, they don't want to read books that are hard, then I think we're in, uh, we're in serious trouble. I think you're going to have the last question. It's got to be real short. Thanks, Professor Carter. Um, just a brief question about how you started writing fiction. You know, were you always a reader? Is this something that you've always wanted to do? Were you yanked in? Just curious. Um, w I started writing fiction when I was a little kid in Washington, D.C. That's, uh, that's a true story. I, um, I went to Margaret M. Amidon Elementary School in southwest Washington, and I lived about two blocks away. And in between Margaret M. Amidon Elementary School and my house was, a was a, a, an apartment building with a little store in the basement, or I guess nowadays it would be called a convenience store. And this is going to tell you how old I was, how old I am now. I, I got my allowance on Fridays, 25 cents was my allowance. And I would, that's not the part that will tell you, uh, <laughs> for all you know, my parents didn't have any money. No, the part, this next part, they'll tell you how old I am. Uh, so when I got my allowance, when school got out at 3 o'clock or whatever time it was, I would stop at the little store on the way home. And with that 25 cents, I bought a comic book, baseball cards, and for 10 cents, a little notebook that it was only like eight pages about this big. I think it might have been spiral bound, but I can't remember if it was had some other kind of volume. It was four pages. And I would take this notebook home, and I would spend the weekend writing what I called my stories. And the stories would be, you know, a, uh, about dinosaurs conquering the earth, and they're defeated by a little boy from Washington, D.C. <laughs> Aliens conquer the earth, they're defeated by a little boy from Washington, D.C. <laughs> Steven Spielberg stole all his material from me, as a matter of fact. I would write these stories, and it just, they were terrible. They had no punctuation, you know, no paragraph breaks, but... But I always loved it, and every job I've had that I've liked has involved in some way writing. One of the things that attracted me to being a law professor as opposed to being a legal practitioner, I obviously admire legal practitioners, and I train them, but one of the things that was attracted to being a law professor is I could write about the subjects I wanted to write about, and the writing attracted me. When I was an undergraduate, I spent all my years, four years undergraduate, working very hard at the student paper, which I was the, a columnist and became the managing editor, and it was the writing that I enjoyed. Everything I've done, I've liked to write. Fiction, nonfiction, whatever it is, I just like writing, and I always have. Thank you all very much, and God bless you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.